Hello and welcome to this presentation about the future of NHS patient safety investigation by the patient safety team at NHS Improvement. The purpose of this presentation is to explain the issues that are currently undermining the quality of investigation across the NHS and to outline how we would like you to help us to address these issues by contributing to the review of the Serious Incident Framework. My name is Lauren Mosley. I work within the Patient Safety Policy and Strategy team at NHS Improvement and I will be joined by my colleague Donna Forsyth, Head of Patient Safety Investigation. When things go wrong in the NHS, we expect NHS providers to report patient safety incidents and to consider the impact of these incidents to determine whether a full investigation is needed. Where a full investigation is needed, NHS providers report a serious incident and undertake a serious incident investigation. There is no absolute definition of a serious incident in healthcare, however, the serious incident framework does describe the circumstances in which serious incidents should be reported. There are well documented weaknesses in the way many organisations currently identify, report, respond and communicate when things go wrong. This has been revealed most compellingly by the patients, families, carers and staff who have shared their experiences of NHS investigation processes. Their stories tell us about the long-term social and psychological damage that the system's behaviour can have when we don't respond appropriately. This harm can extend beyond the harm of the incident itself. Their evidence is the cornerstone of many recent reports, including reports by the Public Administration Select Committee in March 2015, the government's response in the same year, and also reports by the CQC, including the briefing on learning from incidents, and also the CQC's report Learning, Candor and Accountability, published in December 2016. This has helped to drive the widespread recognition about the need to improve and professionalise investigation across the NHS. The establishment of the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch, HSIB, demonstrates this commitment to improving how the NHS investigates incidents for the purpose of learning. HSIB investigates similar incidents that occur in different locations as well as incidents caused by problems that exist across different care settings and it will make recommendations that drive positive change across the healthcare system. By undertaking exemplar investigations, and by doing so demonstrating what good looks like, and by supporting skill development when working with trusts, HSIB will also support improved investigation practice across the NHS. However, HSIB cannot investigate all incidents requiring investigation, so it is therefore vital that providers themselves have the necessary skills and resources to investigate well and that they are enabled by an environment that is supportive of both learning and improvement. Decades of learning in healthcare and other industries has shown that individuals are rarely to blame when things go wrong. Individuals work in complex systems, often undertaking complex tasks in dynamic, multidisciplinary teams and environments. It is not true that if people try hard enough they will not make errors, or that punishment when they do make errors will lead to them making fewer of them. The safest organisations and industries recognise that people make mistakes and the best approach to ensuring safety is to create the systems, processes, practices and environments that support people to do their jobs as safely as possible. This systems approach to safety recognises that incidents are linked to the system in which the individuals are working. Looking at what is wrong with the system helps organisations to identify and address the root causes of a particular incident and therefore prevents it happening again. The NHS Serious Incident Framework provides national guidance for a systems-based investigation method and the principles that underpin this. It endorses root cause analysis, or RCA, as the standard systems-based method for investigation in the NHS. It is clear, however, that many organisations are struggling to routinely deliver investigations that are consistent with guidance included within the Serious Incident Framework. 
We will talk more about this later, but for now I'm going to hand over to Donna to tell you more about what we have learnt about the quality of investigation in the NHS. Before we explore issues with the way investigations are conducted, let's take a minute to consider what a patient safety investigation is really for, and what it's not for. Let's pause for a second to think about it. Patient safety investigations are conducted to prevent or significantly reduce recurrence by identifying the key contributory factors of patient safety related harm, and then to design solutions which target these factors. It's also essential that we include, involve and engage patients, their families and staff in the process. This is to ensure that the investigation is comprehensive in its information, analysis and findings. Patient safety investigations are not conducted to identify the cause of death, nor do they aim to apportion blame, liability or avoidability. We'll talk about this in more detail shortly. The importance of purpose will become clear as we go through this presentation. A key programme of work that provided vital evidence about the barriers to conducting good quality investigation in the NHS was the Patient Safety Investigation Branch Pilot. This sought to test a new approach to driving up the quality of investigation and properly harnessing its power as a tool for learning and improvement. The pilot was led by myself and included a valued team of investigation and subject matter experts, both from healthcare and from other industries. They were enlisted to undertake exemplar investigations of similar incident types in order to identify and reduce contributory and causal factors and also to inform on how we might best direct effort towards the effective and tangible reduction of recurrence. The pilot found the following. Teams of investigators with a deep understanding of investigation and sufficient time to follow good practice principles were able to deliver high quality investigations which included new and previously unreported findings. Many people across the NHS have received investigation training and can often cite the correct purpose and process for learning. However, other factors, which we'll come on to later, are preventing this from happening. NHS organisations appear unaware of the impact of not following good investigation practice. There appears to be a sense that doing something is better than doing nothing at all. But when this process fails to achieve any of its key aims, this is questionable and a potentially significant waste of NHS resource. We also found that similarities in underlying factors abound where the incident type selected is sufficiently narrow. Investigation teams found that once several high quality investigations have been undertaken into the same or very similar incident types, the contributory and causal factors were similar. This indicates that instead of continuing to repeat investigations, time could better be spent on developing and implementing solutions which address these common factors. The pressure to repeatedly investigate similar incidents has created an industry leading to investigation fatigue and repeat incidents could be exacerbated by previous poor quality investigations or weak solutions which provide false assurance. For example, solutions are often borrowed from elsewhere without being properly tested, adapted, adopted or monitored to ensure their effectiveness. Also, weak administrative solutions can be favoured and solutions regularly focus on reminding and retraining, even when there's no evidence that lack of knowledge or understanding. The pilot concluded that the poor quality of local incident investigation is undermining the learning and improvement that should be generated from this investigation process. Many NHS organisations are trying to investigate too many incidents with insufficient resource and effort is spent on repeatedly investigating similar incidents, which spreads resource too thinly and hinders the progression to safety improvement. As a consequence, staff are having to investigate outside working hours, i.e. on top of their day job. There's little resource left to properly identify or implement improvements, and disparate action plans for similar incidents dilute the improvement effort. The evidence, therefore, suggests that a more sustained focus on common underlying factors could provide the greatest potential for improvement. 
In summary, the pilot indicates that we may need an approach which allows the NHS to do fewer but better investigations. The findings of the Patient Safety Investigation Branch pilot reinforce the arguments made by Sally Adams and Charles Vincent, who developed the original protocol for investigation in the NHS. Their guidance states that in-depth analysis of a small number of incidents will bring greater dividends than a cursory examination of a large number. Since the NHS is unlikely to be able to substantially increase its investment in investigation, and also because there is evidence that current resource could be used more effectively, we need to consider how the system can improve the quality and efficacy of investigations to maximise their impact on improvement activity. It's important to note that the ambition to learn more from fewer investigations does not diminish the importance and impact of incidents that are not selected for safety investigation, particularly to the patients, families and carers involved. Neither does it change the requirements outlined in the duty of candour, which requires patients and or families to receive an apology and information about what went wrong when a notifiable incident occurs. Of course, if there is to be an investigation, information about this must also be shared to comply with this duty. Currently, the NHS approach to investigation is very reactive. One way of achieving quality over quantity could be to adopt a more proactive approach and use the principles of risk management to prioritise the investigation of incidents that have the highest risk and highest potential for improvement to ensure that these are addressed first. This approach could be part of an overarching safety strategy, which could be revised every year or two, for example, and set out which incidents will be prioritised for investigation. Of course, this would need to include never events and incidents identified through the learning from deaths process, where a death is believed more likely than not to be due to problems in care. Organisations should also build in capacity for significant new risks that may emerge during the time frame of their strategy where vital new information about systems and processes affecting patient safety could be revealed. We believe this kind of approach could help ensure that each investigation is delivered to a higher quality and that sufficient resource remains to deliver subsequent effective and sustainable safety improvements for each issue arising. I'm now going to hand over to Lauren, who will tell you more about what we found that can challenge good quality investigation in the NHS. As part of early engagement around the review of the Serious Incident Framework, NHS Improvement presented and discussed the ideas that Donna has just introduced with stakeholders across the system. This included those who joined the Patient First Conference in November 2017. Since then, we have been reflecting on the feedback provided and have developed a programme of engagement which we hope will allow as many people as possible to contribute to the review of the Serious Incident Framework. This programme will run until the middle of June and if you are watching this presentation you have already found our website where we will continue to post information and opportunities for further engagement. The next part of this presentation describes the work we have done to further explore the key causal factors associated with the problems leading to poor quality investigations. We'd really like your ideas on how we can address these issues. NHS Improvement has not made any decisions about how to change the Serious Incident Framework, but some suggestions are given to help generate further ideas. Please read our discussion document for full details and provide your feedback using the online survey. You can see the link here in this slide. To identify key issues associated with investigation practice, we started by mapping the investigation process and by that we mean what should happen during an investigation. We then use lots of evidence, including reports, reviews, interviews and observations of people doing investigations to identify the key problems associated with each phase. After that, we analyse these problems to identify the contributory factors and the key causal factors. We won't go over all of the details in this presentation, as the discussion document provides you with all the information you need. However, over the next few slides, we will outline what we believe to be the key causal factors and where we would like your help to inform the solutions to help us address them. 
The first key causal factor was defensive cultures and lack of trust. And although there are areas of good practice, this can be observed at all levels of the NHS. Too often, patients, families and carers are not treated in an open and transparent way. And a bit like the patient's story illustrated on this slide, they feel shut out of the process and do not have an opportunity to have their questions and concerns heard and responded to. Whether this culture is deliberate or an inadvertent consequence of poor systems or fear about sharing information, it results in people losing trust in the NHS. As suspicion and mistrust develop, people seek answers from other means, often requesting an independent investigation or feeling forced to pursue litigious routes. Patients, families and carers are often the only people who have the full story so their involvement is also vital from a learning perspective since they hold key information that can really tell us what happened. The staff involved in serious incident investigations can also face a defensive approach from their employer. They are not always kept informed or involved in the investigation process and are sometimes dismissed from work or informally suspended pending the outcome of an investigation. It's not clear that they always receive the support they need either, and even if a report does mention that support was received by staff, this is typically a generic statement repeated from other investigation reports. This is something the CQC found in their briefing paper, which was published in 2016. Failure to support and involve staff allows a blame culture to develop. And this is reinforced when investigation reports in further error is the fault of individuals by recommending periods of self-reflection or retraining to prevent incidents recurring. Although this may not be intentional, blame is directed at the individuals involved. We talked earlier about the importance of a systems approach to safety, which recognises that human error is normal and can be determined by the condition of a finite number of performance influencing factors. While these factors can be predicted and addressed when using a systems-based approach, too often NHS investigations stop at the person who did something wrong and we need to consider how we can change that. The second key causal factor to problems associated with poor investigation is the widespread inappropriate use of the SI process. One issue is that it is inappropriately used as a performance measure and this has been driven in part by the belief that the serious incident data can provide information and assurance about safety performance and improvement. When systems become aware of a new risk or want assurance about a potentially high profile risk, there is a tendency to mandate the reporting of those incidents as serious incidents and to use that information to track performance. This approach is also used in response to perceived concerns about consistency of reporting and the desire to ensure that organisations report all incidents that they should report. However, when incident reporting information is used for performance monitoring, people can become concerned about being held to account for factors outside of their control. Disputes between providers and commissioners can also arise because there is disagreement about the need to continuously invest resource in the investigation of incidents of a similar type. Multiple and varying definitions of preventable, avoidable, expected, unexpected, natural or unnatural have therefore been introduced to try and rationalise and justify when incidents should be reported and investigated as serious incidents. The use of serious incident reporting and investigation for performance management has the potential to undermine learning and improvement in several ways. Firstly, incidents can be inappropriately defined as unavoidable or expected in advance of a careful review comparing the care provided with the care that would have been expected given our understanding of acceptable clinical practice at the time and also the wider circumstances within which the incident occurred. Secondly, there can be a reluctance to report incidents that are the result of problems in care across several settings. This links to fear that organisations may be held to account for identifying and resolving issues beyond their sole control. 
Thirdly, investigations can be completed to satisfy a process and not to improve patient care. Currently, some investigations are being mandated regardless of the circumstances, so time is spent investigating very similar incidents which fail to generate new learning. This can overload the system and result in investigation fatigue and fragmented action planning and monitoring, which dilutes improvement efforts across the system. In addition, and as Donna described earlier, there is evidence from the pilot patient safety investigation branch and other research that more could be learnt about what went wrong and how this can be avoided by robustly investigating a selection of similar incidents rather than superficially investigating certain incidents every time they occur. The second issue is that the scope of serious incident investigations are inappropriately extended to include questions about cause of death, professional liability and fitness to practice for example. Sometimes those affected may want to know who is accountable and whether those people will remain in post, but these issues must be considered separately to an investigation for the purposes of learning. Occasionally, of course, a safety investigation may reveal evidence that an individual's action may have been unacceptable. And if it does, issues need to be referred to the individual's employer and potentially their professional regulator. The safety investigation itself, however, is conducted for the purposes of learning only. There can also be pressure to declare a serious incident, as not doing so might lead to the perception that the incident is not being treated seriously, or that without a full investigation, specific questions from the patients, families, carers and staff cannot be answered. However, information from the incident report and early review of what happened can often provide key details to answer those questions. The third key factor relating to poor quality investigation practice relates to a misaligned oversight and assurance system. So as the serious incident framework states, the provider organisation is responsible for the management of the serious incident investigation and the commissioner, whether that's NHS England or a clinical commissioning group, is responsible for quality assuring the investigation report and agreeing closure once the investigation is deemed complete. NHS England, in its system oversight role, CQC and NHS Improvement, particularly at a regional level, will also have an interest in overall effectiveness of systems for learning. As a result, they often request information on specific cases as well as broader performance data related to serious incident investigations. While these processes seek to maintain and improve the quality of serious incident investigation, a more considered approach to compliance monitoring may be needed, as the performance metrics used are often too simplistic and process focused. For example, the number of incidents reported and compliance with the 60 day deadline for report completion do not provide information on the quality of investigation when considered in isolation. Focusing on these metrics can also drive unanticipated consequences. For example, Patients, families and key members of staff may not be involved in the investigation process because this can take too long and could result in a breach of the 60-day deadline. Another common problem is that organisations are often benchmarked on the number of serious incidents reported, but this sort of comparison is not helpful for the purposes of learning, particularly when a judgement is made that one organisation may be better or safer based on the number of serious incidents alone. This only weakens a reporting culture, especially the reporting of incidents that may span organisational boundaries because there is debate about who the SI should be reported by and where it should be counted. Ultimately, there is no correct number of serious incidents, so if you benchmark the wrong example, the copied organisational model may only set you back in your efforts to improve. I'll now hand over to Donna to explain the final two factors that we believe are having a significant impact on the quality of investigation. The fourth key factor was a lack of time and expertise at different levels of the NHS to support the investigation and oversight process. The National Serious Incident Framework recommends that the time frame for completion of an investigation 
is 60 working days. However, internal approval of the investigation report before submission to commissioners can take time because relevant committees will need to sign it off. In some cases, the most time-consuming parts of the investigation process, such as interviewing those affected, including patients, families, carers and staff, are omitted to meet demand and to comply with the strict timeframes driving organisations' internal processes. In the discussion document, we've included ideas on how timeframes might be agreed and managed in the future so that compliance with deadlines doesn't undermine quality. We welcome your ideas on this. We're also interested in how the framework can better describe the expertise that's required to deliver good quality investigations. Often there's an assumption made that anyone can do an investigation. Let's consider a doctor, for example, as pictured here. Clearly we expect that before a doctor practices, they undertake many years of training and then have ongoing development. But what about investigators in the NHS? Or indeed doctors or managers that are asked to investigate on top of their day job? Investigation is a complex process and requires expert skill and knowledge. As well as reconstructing a scenario and analysing everyday tasks and normal practice, investigators need to source and organise evidence from experts independent of the incident, as well as from those directly involved such as patients, families, carers and staff. They then need to analyse this information to understand how and why problems arose. An understanding of human factors and improvement science is essential for clarifying which problems occurred, determining why they may have happened and recommending what should be done to significantly reduce their recurrence. Managing relationships with those who might be experiencing one of the most traumatic times in their lives is also key. Despite these challenges, investigators are often clinicians or managers who've had little or no training in the science of investigation. And even if they have, they may not have had an opportunity to shadow or to seek support from experienced investigators before they're asked to lead their own investigation. In other high-risk industries, investigators will have had the benefit of several weeks of training and support. We need to consider how we can help to professionalise investigation across the NHS and to ensure appropriate time and resources are made available. The fifth and final key issue was the lack of evidence-based methodology. The Seamus Incident Framework has always endorsed evidence-based tools and templates and describes what an effective, systems-based patient safety investigation must involve. The whole of this end-to-end -end process is commonly referred to in the NHS as root cause analysis, or RCA. Although the term root cause analysis has been widely adopted and embedded as the national approach to investigation in the NHS, it's clear that the methodology is rarely properly understood or appropriately applied in local investigations. RCA methodology is sometimes cited as the cause of investigation flaws, but review of local investigations in the NHS demonstrates that the problems are associated with poor implementation of recommended good practice. One of the most common issues linked to lack of evidence-based methodology in local NHS investigations is the disproportionate focus on the early phases of the investigation. That is, the process of deciding if an investigation is indicated and the evidence gathering phases to determine what happened. Too little attention is given to exploring all the sources of information available and to fulfilling the later phases of the process, that is the analysis of problems and identifying the key underlying factors to reach a determination of why it happened. As a result, Investigation conclusions concentrate on judgments about avoidability, preventability or predictability, which is not the purpose of safety investigation, as described earlier. We've also mentioned that patient safety investigators are often asked to conduct RCA to satisfy the needs of a whole range of other different investigation types. This can lead to a conflict of purpose if issues such as liability, professional performance and cause of death are considered as part of the same process. As a result of these findings, work is now underway to revise national investigation tools and guidance to achieve a more effective, standardised, systems-based approach 
to investigation across the NHS. This includes development of a single standard investigation report template and development of an investigation quality assessment tool. This is designed for use by staff who are appropriately trained in investigation since uptake of the tool alone will not ensure good quality investigation. We also plan to discontinue use of the terms concise and comprehensive investigation. Concise investigation is now commonly associated with a less rigorous process rather than one that condenses the key components of an investigation into a more concise report format. Work is also underway to develop a revised set of principles which support good practice in local investigation across the NHS. These closely align with those developed by HSIB, the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch, although the principle of independence will not be possible to replicate at a local level where investigations must instead be expertly and objectively overseen. We've developed these principles to shape the anatomy of investigation. Please take some time to consider these and the associated detail shown here, as we'd like your feedback on them. You can give us feedback by referring to our discussion document after this presentation. Thanks for listening. We're interested in your ideas on all of the issues we've discussed. These include how the serious incident framework could be revised to reduce defensiveness and to increase openness so that patients, families, carers and staff are more effectively involved and supported. We're also interested in how the serious incident framework could support more effective use of investigation resources. We've included some suggestions for you to comment on and to help generate discussion, but we're interested in new ideas too. Some ideas include setting a minimum number of investigations for organisations to undertake so that these can be properly resourced and requiring organisations to develop an investigation strategy which determines which incidents will be investigated and how these will be resourced. And being clearer in future guidance that where measurable improvements are being made in relation to repeat incidents, these don't have to be continually investigated. We would also like your ideas on how we could better align the oversight and assurance processes to improve the environment for learning and improvement, on how the serious incident framework could be changed to help ensure the necessary time and expertise is devoted to investigation, including how we might change national time frame requirements. And finally, how the framework can support better uptake of an evidence-based methodology in local investigations. Please read our discussion document for full details. All questions and ideas are included within the blue boxes, but we welcome further thoughts and feedback too. If you require an easy read version, this has been made available. Please provide all feedback via the online survey, which will remain open until June 2021.